Hey, what's up, fellas? What we're looking at here is the rocket burner. This thing is a surface mix burner that I'm injecting two oxygen lances at a divergent angle so that they collide in the middle of the flame to make a burner melt just about any metal we throw in the crucible. What we're looking at here is one of my latest contraptions. This is the Godzilla burner with the air preheat loop, but I've added a little extra. We've got a second line connected to this thing with two little spray nozzles there that I'm going to be injecting pure oxygen into. And I've got a little bit of a strategy in mind. The reason for this is people are often contacting me wanting to melt carbon steel. And the reality is that most forced air furnaces cannot get over 2,900 degrees. It's just kind of a wall. It's like a sound barrier for air burners. So we're going to break the sound barrier with this thing, basically. And what we have here is an old piece of pipe. This is cast iron, and this is carbon steel. We can melt this, no problem, with the Godzilla burner with the preheat. We don't need any extra for that. We can do that in eight minutes from a cold start. But the carbon steel, however, which is about 2,800 degrees, it is a little bit harder to do. So I've got a strategy in mind here. What we're looking at here is a foundry furnace that some of you have seen before. And it's just standard 2,700 degree refractory material that you can pick up at Lowe's or Menards. The maximum temperature drop I've ever been able to get this thing up to is about 2,650 degrees that I have on record. Based on some things I've melted, I think I have hit 2,600 or 700, but I only have it on record at uh, 2,650 Fahrenheit. So here is the old Godzilla burner, but there's a bunch of melted slag that's made its way through that I need to bust out of there. So we're going to take this thing apart or take this burner out. We're gonna chip away some of the melted material. This hole is just kind of melting over on itself, so I need to do something about that. I'm gonna chisel that out. But this is what it looks like after about uh, over 20 firings at 2,650 degrees. It's held up fantastic. The first thing I'm gonna do is set this thing up on a bench so we can observe the flame and we're gonna run it on diesel. All right, so after doing a little more research in my lab book, come to find out this particular foundry furnace has done at least 30 burns. Same thing with this burner. Um, actually the burner's probably only had about 28 because I used a silicon carbide burner in it twice just to test it, but I went ahead and took it apart. This thing has been sitting for a year. A bunch of slag fell out of the furnace into the burner there. <laughs> there might be gold and everything else in this. I had a crucible break on me, so all of this right here could potentially be gold bearing material. Basically what I gotta do is chip out a little bit of the entranceway there. You can see how this material is just starting to sag down into the way of the hole from the excessive heat. So I don't know how much I'm gonna chip out, but this is what happens when you use 2700 degree refractory for a long duration of time at 2700 degrees. Very porous, but nonetheless, it's holding up. Anyone who's ever tried to make one of these things before um, knows that they do fall apart after a while. So to get one to last for, you know, 30 burns and still pretty much be held together. The purpose of this whole thing is this burner only gets us up to 2,650 degrees on average. So with this burner here, we're hoping to achieve 3,000 degrees. There's our oxygen lances, and those are at an angle. I don't know if you can see the bend in that or not, but there is a bend to those tubes, 
so that the oxygen meets at a point. It's a fan spray, so hopefully we've got two fan sprays going into the fuel stream, and that will hopefully give us some extremely hot flames hot enough to melt the crucible. So, as I said, there's a strategy involved here, and here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna run the burner on just diesel and air, compressed air, to get us up to the 2600 degrees. Then, after about, I'm gonna let it run for about uh, 15, 20 minutes to be sure that we're fully at the temp. It can take up to a half hour to get one of these things up to maximum temperature, and I know that based on my anode sludge melting research. So this is the finished hole. Some of the stuff fell out of the top there, so I got it upside down and I added a little bit more refractory so that that metal isn't just getting blasted with heat. So I wanted to fill in that cavity. All right, guys, so I'm getting ready to add some oxygen to this flame. And you're gonna notice the flame's gonna get drastically smaller. We did not change the fuel input. We're simply burning the same amount of fuel in a smaller area. So the secret sauce to what I'm trying to make happen is this. Consider you've got a furnace, a uh, foundry furnace going, and you've reached the maximum temperature and you're trying to get hotter. So what do you do? You turn the fuel up. Well, what will happen is a flame will shoot out of the top of that foundry furnace. The more fuel you add, the higher that flame will get. Typically, I never allow my flame to be six inches off the discharge port of the foundry because doing so actually decreases the temperature. There is a fuel-air mixture ratio that you need to achieve to get the maximum temperature. You can't just keep dumping fuel in there. So, the oxygen being added to this flame in itself is not the secret. What's going to happen is when we get the flame, say, shooting a foot off the top of the foundry and we turn on the oxygen, we're going to find that the flame will disappear and go all the way down inside the furnace. So we are then going to add more fuel until we see the flame again, maybe six inches off the top, and then we're going to dump in even more oxygen. And it's going to allow us to burn maybe four to five times as much fuel in that same little tiny area as we were before. And that is the secret mechanism that's going to enable us to melt a crucible full of broken up camshafts or some other high melting point alloy that your standard conventional process just can't touch. So that is the secret. It's not the oxygen flame. I'm not interested in making an oxyacetylene cutting torch here. I'm interested in getting more fuel to burn inside the foundry itself because when this burner is connected to a foundry, it in effect becomes a pre-burner. That's it. The combustion chamber itself is actually the foundry furnace, not this burner. This burner is just a pre-burner at that point. So just a way to look at that differently. There is a little bit more of an underlying secret to what I'm trying to pull off here than just a hot oxygen flame. All right, I'm doing this section for some of you hardcore diehards who want to hear the actual sound, so I'm not going to mess with the sound levels of the burner itself. I want you guys to hear the difference. Right here, I'm simply adjusting the fuel-to-air mixture. There is no oxygen on that flame. I just want to show you guys the turndown ratio of this thing. So here is a little bit of oxygen added, and you can see it really reduces the size. I need to aim them nozzles a little bit to converge just right. There we are. At, um, you can see that the gauge is slowly moving. So this little tank wouldn't be ideal, but with a good sized oxygen concentrator that you can connect to a large air compressor, I think we'd be in there. That's my next move. I'm going to build a two tank oxygen concentrator that just hooks up to an air compressor. Not one of those big expensive medical type setups. but. This is pretty much what we've got going on here. This thing is so loud that um, I couldn't get my decibel meter to read it right. So I'm looking for a decibel meter that will function properly above 100 decibels. This is at about 40 PSI of oxygen. You can see that tank is just, the gauge is slowly dropping. Not nothing real drastic. I think we're going to be able to melt a couple crucibles of carbon steel with this thing, no problem. Just wanted to show you guys the different flame settings this thing can do. 
while we're at it. And this is what we got. That right there looks like about five, six and a half. That is about 370, 350 kilowatts or so there. And I'm gonna turn it up all the way here. And that is right around 500 kilowatts of power. Maybe a little bit more than that. About uh, 550 to 600 kilowatts. So, just wanted to show you guys that um, it can do some high fire stuff, but we don't need that. This is where we would be running it, which is right around 180 kilowatts or so. And that's about four cubic foot per minute, and we're at about 75 PSI of air pressure.